Schopenhauer was especially uh, irate against uh, the Jews for animal cruelty. He he blamed the Jews for animal, uh, you know, um, vivisection. You know, for when you do experiments on animals, uh, he 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 traces all the way back to Genesis. Uh, in fact, one of the first things the Nazis did in 1933 was to pass an animal rights law. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't know this, but it's true. Uh, 1934, my home state of Washington gave Hitler a uh, hum Humane Society Award. It was like the Eichelberger Humane Award, 1934. It's in my own, you know, Seattle, I'm not too far from here. And here are all these people, when I wrote this article about this green uh, Nazi, Alan Seifer, st starting Stormwater. Okay, my own city of Seattle gave the, the, the Hitler, the Fuhrer, an award for being such a guy who loved animals. Mm -hmm. so, so this was not, so he was well known by then, even by 1933, for being a, uh, for being a nature bark. I got to move that. No problem. I'm sorry about that. My sister walks in. She never does this. No <laughs> she problem. happened to do it today because we're on. You have to cut that out. So yeah, I'm we'll sorry. Yeah, that's what, uh, sis that's what sisters are for. They're there to mess right. up their brothers. <laughs> she's never been there. And then she's here this morning. Oh, so sorry about that. Anyway. So they had an animal rights law they passed in 1933. And one of the things that they did, probably the most important thing they did, they banned Jewish kosher slaughter yep. for being too cruel. And of course, Schopenhauer talked about this too. And they made a big movie about this. The Nazis did in 1940 about how cruel the, the Jews were to the animals. This in 1940, they call it the eternal Jew. See, that's against this existentialism of this life, okay? This life only. Then you have the eternal Jew because he's borrowing things that are not true from the transcendent outside that's just superstition. Oh, interesting. And they have, yeah, they've given us a, a worldview that is very destructive to the world we live in and especially toward animals. So, uh, and this is actually highlighted as the most heinous aspect of why the Jews need to be eradicated. So if you look at the eternal Jew, this documentary lasts, I think about an hour and they go through various things, you know, why they're evil, why they're not good. You know, they're in the ghettos and, you know, you go through this and that. And the other thing, they sit, they don't want to work. And, uh, you know, they just go to the banks. They run, you know, the, the Hollywood of Germany back then. They corrupt our, our society with the things that they are presenting. So it goes on and on. But then the climax of this, of this documentary, and it, it really spends a lot of time with this, is animal cruelty, kosher slaughter. And they actually show the process to make people really angry at, uh, you know, at, at the Jewish people. So and that's called the Eternal Jew. It was broadcast. It was you know, put in all the, the movies of, you know, movie halls of, of Nazi Germany in those days and other places, too. And so that's Schopenhauer's connection that, you know, what he calls the odor of the Jews. OK, uh, eventually leads to what the Nazis presented to Germany, uh, you know, the Eternal Jew. So th I think the thing that was most informative for me about your book, and, and I'm very grateful that I had the chance to kind of reread it preparing for the interview. So, you know, most reading is rereading. And so to go through it, I read it in December, January, February of this year, and then to pick it up again after some of the ideas had settled in and re-engage with the material to see the various streams. So we can talk about existentialism, or we can talk about social Darwinism, or we can talk about um, romanticism, that all of these were various tributaries that right. fed one big river. And right. each individual tributary in and of itself might not necessarily lead to that inevitable conclusion. But when you fuse them all together, you get something truly explosive and destructive that we don't really understand today for the reason that you had said earlier, that Germany has never really fully repented for what actually went on. In fact, it sounds like from the early narrative of the book, what instead happened is uh, the, the National Socialism Nazi movement was politicized very quickly by the Allied powers to make it into the enemy that they needed it to be, covered up a lot of what was actually going on. And then we just went about our business, all of us carrying these lies about who the National Socialists really were. And, and that seems to me to be to be the case. And now people have these ideas from film and TV, right, and, and uh, the media, essentially, that paint the picture of Nazis as, as Christians and capitalists, 
when they they hated both of those things, which is the, which is the hysterical part. Well, I mean, the, the, I don't when they arrived in in Nazi Germany, the army, and I don't think they had really a solid understanding of what's really going on with the, the worldview of national socialism. They they just they were just shocked at how is it that a so-called educated country could do this, and they're not looking at things deeply and more seriously that look at the same so-called most educated society of Germany. Uh, they gave spawn to the Reformation, okay, with Martin Luther, but within a couple hundred years, they're already rebelling against that. So by the 1800s, it's an all-out assault against the Bible, which probably is at the real root of everything. I don't really talk about that little bit uh, in the because that's really not the point of what I'm trying to get at. But another argument could be made is that the higher criticism that we've heard so much about, okay, uh, and, and some of these guys were also anti-Semites involved with this, uh, and, and if they weren't maybe vocally per se, still the whole uh, the whole edifice was anti-Semitic. They're trying to get rid of the Jewish elements, and they started out by attacking the historicity, you know, of the Bible, and largely because of its so-called Jewish influences, which goes back to Immanuel Kant, and he's another rabid anti-Semite that people don't understand either. He was extremely critical uh, of Jewish people. You don't see this in his writings, but his, his lectures were full of uh, anti-Semitism. So he also, and he also used the word exterminate uh, when he talked about Jewish people, that, that term. So Schopenhauer and, uh, you know, maybe not the exact German term, I, don't, I couldn't tell you what that was, but the idea, you know, it's pretty, it's not good, mm -hmm. is that you, know, you have Kant and you have Schopenhauer, they become like prophets of the future for Germany, even though they would have been aghast at what the Nazis actually did. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, you know, when, when you put forth these ideas, and at the time, we, people really all pay attention to them and things like this, it seems like it's an innocuous idea, but they're really not. And over time, these, these ideas metastasize into something very serious, like the tributaries, you mentioned, a very good illustration. And finally, it coalesces into you know, the, the drain that goes out to the ocean, then that's where it's a big problem. So now, now my wife. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ladies, so, the boys are talking. Yeah, right. So, right. Anyway, um, it's um, it's it's just a big topic and it's hard to. So my book details all of those different different discussions and. And people just don't know that history. See, and it's very difficult to know it. I mean, you have to spend time and they just kind of ignore it. And part of it is because today we live in such an existentialist world anyway. That's what we call postmodernism. Okay. Mm -hmm. So people don't care about what people believe anymore. So they don't look at it. They don't take it serious. Mm -hmm. And so the beliefs of the Nazis, uh, I was amazed. Okay. I've looked at, I've read lots of books on national socialism. Okay. Lots yeah. of times. Okay. 15 page bibliography. <laughs> I mean, and, and there are there are very few books that you can find that actually try to explain what the Nazis actually believed. Mm -hmm. So what what they've done is that they've projected onto the Nazis things that really aren't true uh based on their own whatever though these guys were mean racist. Okay. Okay, well that's that's true, but why are why were they mean racist? How did they get there? They're not answering that question. They don't even ask the questions about it. And, and they're very superficial and, and simplistic answers. And the whole anti-God, the anti-biblical, anti-reformation stuff played a big role because in order to become an existentialist, okay, you have to reject the Bible, see. So Germany was supposedly in, in its reformation. And then during this time, uh, they make this transition from the reformation to existentialism. And then after National Socialism, we have what we call postmodernism, and all these ideas are still with us. They they have not. Mm -hmm. They've they've just trained. They've they, they've changed into something new in terms of labels, but basically it's the same ideas, but the, the names have changed. So I want to drill in to the specific German Romantic anti-Semitism. Because we're shown this today, and I think we've all been shown German anti-Semitism our whole lives. You know, not a year goes by where there's not a new Holocaust movie. But as you said, very rightly, no one asks why. The the it's just assumed like, oh, they just they just hate the Jews. Well, they just hate the Jews. Right. But but 
the German romantic element, as you laid it out with Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and Kant, it had a specifically environmental quality to it. That was the real, let's call it sin, from the German romantic perspective. So maybe we can talk about that because that speaks to, I think, a question that, as you just said, no one really asks, like, why? And, and the roots of that were ultimately environmentalist in nature. So maybe we can talk about that for a moment because that just opens the door, I think, to everything else. Well, uh, see, uh, Schopenhauer and Nietzsche were existentialist, okay? And then, then, but then before that, you have what we call romanticism. And this is, I don't know how to characterize them. It, it, you know, they want to be one with nature. It's kind of a romance yeah. with nature, okay? And the idea is to commune with the natural world in such a way that uh, we don't abuse it, okay? So th this is what we call the romantic um, worldview, which in Germany was pretty strong. I mean, it was also in England too, but but in Germany, it takes on this an anti-Semitic role. So again, they're they're blaming, the German romantics are blaming the Jews uh, for the destruction of nature, okay? They're in the cities, okay? They're they're running the banks and, 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 and the train system, and, and this is leading to the destruction of the forest and, and you know, the things that are dear to our folk culture, you know, that we grew up close to the land, okay? So that kind of stuff. It's uprooting us from our foundations, you know, on this romantic world that we, you know, that we think that we live in, see? Uh, that, you know, the farm, the pastoral background, uh, you know, from a romantic point of view, that, it's actually anti-God, strangely enough, anti-biblical. But still, mm -hmm. uh, the Romantic movement preceded all that. And so they also had this anti-Semitic bent to it. Uh, probably the most, there's a number of them, but probably the most anti-Semitic uh, is his, you know, his name was, um, again, he was like in the 1860s, Re-El. So he was a very a strong anti-Semite. He was a forester. He liked, you know, he, liked the, he was into teaching on forestry professor, you know, he had a big impact. He wrote some books, The Natural History of Germany, three volume set. I've, I've read through a lot of it. Uh, again, a number of anti-Semitic quotes, okay, that are presented in his book, it, blaming the Jews for this kind of ecological destruction. They didn't call it ecology back then, they would just call it nature. So the man that actually uh, invented the word ecology is Ernst Haeckel. And he was a German social Darwinist. Okay, the first, he's really the father of German social Darwinism. And he was a man that took, uh, you know, Darwin's view of, you know, evolution and converted it into social Darwinism. He made it more social, see. He made it more political. Okay, and, and so, you know, Darwin's going to be, he's more English, he's going to be more hesitant to do that. But the Nazis, I, I mean, the Germans, and the Nazis later on, too, would, would adopt many of these ideas. Uh, he, he's going to actually socialize this, this view. He's going to, uh, he, he's a scientist, but he, he's like a social scientist along with it, see? Even though he was, a, I think, a paleontologist, if I remember correctly. But he's the one who, uh, you know, coined the term ecology in 1866. And then he's the father of German social Darwinism. So they're at the root of environmentalism. In ecology, you have racism. And by the way, when, when people start talking about overpopulation, okay, uh, to me, there, there is no better to be sitting there talking about overpopulation than racism. It's the same thing as far as I'm concerned, because racism is just one form of anti-humanism. And today, our world is very anti-humanistic. Uh, nature is everything today. And at some point, something bad is going to happen to people because of, of these bad ideas, okay? And we're not quite there yet, but you can see where things are headed, and uh, it may take longer than we realize, like always, okay, but at some point, something bad is going to happen, and it's because of these bad ideas, and romanticism also played a role, so you have romanticism, okay, romance with nature, yeah, commune with nature, a holistic view of nature, that's against the holiness of God, you know, if you look at the Hebrew term, for example, uh, the word for holy basically sometimes can mean whole, okay, but the, the holism, the holiness comes from God from the outside, from the transcendent source. It doesn't come from with you. It doesn't come from nature. So what the romantics want is for nature to give us purity. Mm -hmm. So they, they strangely think that nature is pure. And the, I mean, I, and this is this is actually at the root of a lots of strange 
faulty ideas about how to fix uh, the environmental catastrophe of our world. They, they think nature is pure. So what you have to do is, is set aside people and everything they do. And if we do that, then everything is going to be pure, uh, which is, is false. It's a false idea. It simply is not true at all. The Nazis had a very similar view in the sense we get rid of the Jews. It's going to solve many of our ecological problems, see, our, our biological problems, our ecological problems. And what people don't realize is that with, with Haeckel, okay, he he's going to make us uh, biology, evolution, and social Darwinism into a science, okay? This is this is Haeckel, by the way, not Hegel. Hegel. So H-A-E-C-K-E-L. I'm just making sure to clarify that for listeners that we're not talking about Hegel. Haeckel. The, yes. the mark, Haeckel with a K, Haeckel. Please continue, Haeckel. sir. Hegel's a problem, too. We'll get to him shortly. <laughs> yes. Uh, but but no, and so Haeckel uh, is going to bring all those things together. And he's going to emphasize that, he, you know, he wasn't anti-Semitic, but he's anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, he's pro-nature, anti-Christian. So he blamed Christianity, again, for the, um, you know, for the destruction of nature. So all of those ideas were all there. And they go back to the 1800s. That's sort of the seedbed for all of these things. And it's after, after the Reformation was rejected, see. So yes. once that's done, then you start getting into other ideas. They thought they were progressive, you know. But really, it was heading toward, uh, you know, doomsday. Uh, World War I, and we could talk about that, too, World War, World War II was even worse. So I want yes. to read uh, the Wikipedia entry about Romanticism really quickly because I yeah, think sure. it touches on a lot of things. So Romanticism, also known as the Romantic Movement or Romantic Era, was an artistic and intellectual movement that originated in Europe towards the end of the 18th century, so the 1700s. The purpose of the movement was to advocate for the importance of subjectivity, imagination, and appreciation of nature and society and culture in response to the Age of Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Romanticists rejected the social conventions of the time in favor of a moral outlook known as individualism. They argued that passion and intuition were crucial to understanding the world and that beauty is more than merely an altar, an affair of form, but rather something that evokes a strong emotional response. With, with this philosophical foundation, the Romantics elevated several key themes which they were deeply committed, to which they were deeply committed a reverence for nature and the supernatural, an idealization of the past as a noble era, nobler era, a fascination with the exotic and the mysterious, and a celebration of the heroic and the sublime. And so the Wikipedia article, and I'm going to try and share my screen right now, um, the Wikipedia article uh, shows an image that I think um, it looks like uh, it looks like I'm not going to be able to share my screen at the moment using this using this software, but uh, we'll add it in. We'll try and add it in afterwards. So the Wikipedia article shows the very famous painting "Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog" by Caspar David Friedrich. So for listeners, you've seen this painting before many many times, particularly in the masculinity movement. It depicts a man standing at the pin a pinnacle of rock, uh, pinnacle of rock. He's got a flaming red hair, and he's looking out over a sea of clouds. This used to be one of my favorite paintings for a very long time. This is a, the, one of the signature works of the Romantic movement is Wanderer Above the sea of, the, a sea of Fog. And you can see a lot of those ideas from Romanticism embodied in that painting and the artist himself, Caspar David Friedrich, who used to be one of my favorite painters as well. So the Romantic era had a particularly, particularly strong grip over the German imagination for thinking about things in an unbiblical and anti-biblical way. So I just wanted to lay that sort of philosophical groundwork for everyone listening so they understand just how powerful the Romantic movement was, because this is not, we're rooting our truth in the Bible, we're rooting the truth in God's word, so we're rooting it in nature, we're rooting in individualism, we're rooting it in, um, in uh, mysticism and the exotic and, and the heroic past not in the eternal word of God. And this took place in the late 1700s. Well, let me, uh, let me read a quote from uh, Ernst Lehman. Uh, he was a biology professor 1880 to 1957. And he was also a, a national socialist and noted that this is what his view of national socialism was. He says, we recognize that separating humanity from nature, from the whole of life, there's our holism, leads to humankind's own destruction and to the death of nations. Only through a reintegration of humanity into the whole of nature can our people be made stronger. That is the fundamental point of the biological tasks of our age. So there's our racism in terms of 
uh, social Darwinism and uh, evolutionary theory, you know, that type of stuff. 